starting off this series right here. Why is it that every time we, we, we want to do something right, we want to do something good, and, and we all get the same idea, man, I want to do something for God, or I want to do something good with my life. I'm going to start working out. Let's go with that one. I'm going to start working out, and then you're like, well, you know, there's always Monday, you know, there's all... You know, I'm going to start a diet. I'm going to start the ketogenic diet, man. It's going to be awesome. And then you go to the 4th of July and it's like nothing but cupcakes. Far as the eye can see, right? It can be hard. I I know. I know it can be hard. The point is clear. We need more than knowledge of what to do. Because obviously, knowing the right thing to do is not the end. It's actually putting the right thing into practice. Isn't that right, everybody? We all know this. We all know this. But listen to what the scripture has to say about it. This is Paul writing in Romans 7 about himself. So if you ever felt bad about yourself because you didn't do what you thought you should do, listen to this guy who wrote like a bunch of the New Testament. Look at what he says about himself on the screens in your notes, Romans 7. I don't understand myself really for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Written by the Apostle Paul. So if you feel bad about yourself here today, you can go ahead and stop that right now. <laughs> because this guy knows, he knows what you're feeling. We have a tendency to struggle with identity and execution and the things that we want to do. But Paul says he doesn't even understand himself. He wants to be pure. That sometimes maybe he's tempted to do immoral things. I never knew the guy. I don't know what he dealt with. But for us, all of us, we want to be pure all the time. But sometimes we're tempted to do something that's not pure. We want to be wise, but sometimes we do foolish things. I'm not looking at anybody, all right? I'm just saying, that's what, it's the truth. It's the truth. Well, the book of Proverbs, which is what this series is all about, is packed full of wisdom that can, it is more than just knowing the right thing. It helps us to put it into practice in our life because we have this dualistic nature in humanity that we all struggle with. There's no better book in the entire Bible than the book of Proverbs to discover wisdom for your life. Does anybody want to be wiser? Anybody? Okay, thank you. I'm teaching to somebody. I know it. Here's, here's kind of the statement for the series. Wisdom is not just knowing right and wrong. It's applying it to your life. Man, the devil knew what was right and wrong. He just didn't do. You see what I'm saying? Like knowing is not enough. We have to learn how to make it work in our life. I was taught early on in my Christianity by a great pastor. He said, theology needs to end in application or it's not good theology. Man, I, it blew my mind when I heard it. I'm like, wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> but he, but it, it makes sense. If, if, it's, if it's really, truly good theology, which is understanding of the Bible, that's what theology means, is understanding God, the study of God. The real, true execution of theology is application. And that's what I want for all of us, you know? That's what I want. Knowledge constructs the Titanic. Wisdom avoids the icebergs. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. I should have finished with that one. That's like a really good one. Knowledge builds a house, wisdom builds a home. See, it's a difference. There's a difference there. Knowledge knows the danger, wisdom avoids it. We talked about that a lot last week. We talked about that a lot last week. That was a, that was a big message last week. I encourage you to go back and check it out. Knowledge understands God, wisdom walks with God. So last week we did, we talked about purity, and I did want to kind of give a, a quick highlight to that because we talked about, and I'll just summarize it in like one quick takeaway, is we, we talked about the the immoral and the pure, but the real path to purity is to get as far away from temptation as you possibly can. So the actions over here, the temptation is nearby, right? Because you know the difference between being tempted to sin and actually sinning, right? There's a difference. It's an action. We don't want to be anywhere near the action, but I'm telling you, if you want to be wise, the wisdom from scripture says you don't even want to be near the temptation, That's real wisdom, and that's how we truly keep it. I don't even want to be near the door of her house, right? It says immorality is an immoral woman is talked about in here, and today we're going to talk about, (laughs) I'm going to save it for you. Hang on a second. Next week, okay, next week, spoiler alert, we're talking about finances. So if anybody's struggling with finances, anybody feeling inflation these days? It's hard. (laughs) Why are you laughing? Because the second tax day is coming. Oh, my gosh. So last week we talked about purity. Next week, uh, we're talking about finances. So if anybody's struggling with that, more than ever, I want God to be involved in my finances. I don't know about you. It's hard out there right now. But, uh, you know, like I said, um, last week we talked about the immoral woman. Well, this week we're talking about the lazy man, okay? (laughs) If there's an immoral woman in Scripture, then there's a lazy man all over Scripture, okay? (laughs) 
I just had to be fair. Okay, ladies, I had to be fair. You know, last week I told you, I'm not, we're not picking on ladies. It's just the way Solomon described immorality was this figurative immoral woman, right? It's the object of our, of our lust, of the object of our, uh, of the impure things that we want to see. Well, this week, you know, it's the object of our laziness is a guy. He's like, we, he was on the screen. He's got his hand and his, you know, Al Bundy in it right there. If you're old enough to laugh at that, then you just aged yourself. You know, he's in a new, he's in a new show. Never mind, forget it. The lazy man, the lazy man. Of course, of course, let me get back to what I'm saying. This is not gender specific. Uh, Solomon is not intending in the book to be gender specific, like only men are lazy and only ladies are immoral. It's not like that at all. It's just a figurative speech for he's personifying. That means making a person out of an idea. That's personifying something. So he's personifying laziness with the man. So he's talking about this lazy man or the lazy person, depending on what translation you got. And so we're going to talk about this lazy man for a minute. And I just want to prepare you (laughs) because it's really not if you're lazy or not, it's to what degree. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to have some fun today, I hope. And you're going to like, just, it's, it's a joke, everybody, okay? It's like, take it easy. If you get up and, and get out to leave to the bathroom or something, like, there's gonna be judgment. You're gonna be like, well, we know what their deal is because this laziness thing is like, it affects us all. Yeah. It affects us all. So it's just not who, it's just how much you yeah. identify with. Okay, number one, la- the lazy man. Number one, has financial issues, but it's never his fault. If, 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 if you identify with that, do not say amen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's never their fault. He's like, yeah, I got like problems, problems, problems. It's never his fault. Now, again, it's, it's not who, it's just to what degree. So listen to this, Proverbs 24. I walked in the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with nettles, like thorns. It was covered with weeds. Its walls were all broken down. Then I looked and thought about it. I learned this lesson. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands. Have you ever seen someone sleep like this? Emma sleeps like this. I check on her every night and she sleeps a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So notice this characteristic of laziness is financial problems, scarcity, poverty, I'm willing to bet some of us never noticed that before is that laziness ha- tends to be manifested in, man, like it doesn't matter how much you got in the bank, but it's always like this struggle. There's always struggles going on. No, let me, let me uh, try to break it down a little bit. Nobody wants a messy house, but you know, it's just every day. Come on, I'm tired. I'm tired a little bit. Now I just way meddled in your business just now, because if I came to your house, you would be mortified. I understand that. I understand that. Maybe not you, but your neighbor, the person next to you. Nobody wants a messy house. Nobody wants thorns all up in their socks. You know, the the nettles, you know, like when you walk through a field, all those foxtails, you know, nobody wants that stuff in their yard. But, you know, keeping up with that, man, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot every week. Ugh, gotta do that every week. It's like, it's hard. A little more sleep, a little folding of the hands to rest. If you stop and look at the signs and outcomes of laziness, the most common characteristic is poverty and this overgrowing, this this over time, it's crowding into your life. This stuff is crowding into your life. Look at Proverbs 20, verse four. Those too lazy to plow in the right season will have no food at the harvest. Listen, this lazy person or the lazy man, this lazy person, he doesn't do what he should when he should. Come on, some of y'all, come on. I'm just not in the mood right now, okay? I just don't want, I don't want it right now. You know, it's like it's dinner time around the same time every day. But, you know, I just, it's four o'clock. I'm tired right now. I just, I don't, you know, like maybe a little bit. I'll just later, you know, later, just call something in. Just call something and it's, it's just too much work. Not a lot of amens right now, I'm noticing. It's okay, it's okay. But, but life is like the law of the farm. Life is like the law of the farm. You sow when you should, not when you feel like it. You harvest when you should, not when you feel like it. When it's ready is when you do it. And you plow when you should, not when you feel like it, right? So this is a, a characteristic of laziness is that, like, oh, well, just, I just, not right now. I'm tired right today. I'm tired today. You know, I had a hard day yesterday. I get it. 
I, I identify too. I understand. I'm not telling you. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this with you. It's painful. We got to talk about this. Proverbs 10 verse 5 says, a wise youth... Now we're talking about kids, all right? Anybody, anybody like under their 20s right now? I'm talking to you right now. I'm talking to you. A wise youth harvests in the summer, but one who sleeps during harvest is a disgrace. You know what this makes me think of? Sleep habits. If I haven't meddled in your business yet, let's talk about sleep habits, shall we? You know what it's like. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, you, you got an early start tomorrow. Maybe you got to work. You know, you start at like eight or nine. But, you know, TikTok is just so funny, you know? So you're there. You're like, <laughs> oh, table tech lie. <laughs> then it's midnight. Then it's midnight. You, you never considered that to be. And then you're at work and you're like dragging. And your boss is like, come on, pick it up. And you're like, well, I just had, you know, I don't know why. I don't know why it's not working out. I don't know why I'm not getting that promotion. I don't know why things are working. It's because it's, it's a youth that sleeps when he should be awake and who's awake when he should be asleep. No amens if you know what I'm talking about, okay? It's, it's oftentimes if we're struggling during the day, it's what we do the day before and the night before. That matters more than drinking that extra cup of coffee or drinking that extra Celsius or whatever is popular right now. I love those things, by the way. <laughs> you got to go to sleep earlier. I don't know. Go to bed on time, be effective during the day, and excel at work. I'm just saying, this is a characteristic of ladies maybe staying up a little bit too late. Okay, let's, let's move on from that. It's a little touchy. Let's move on from that. The lazy man. Number two, this is a hard one, has hopes and dreams, but won't work for them. Has hopes and dreams. Listen, just like everybody else, but won't work. Like, like the lazy person wants to be fit, but can't bring themselves to exercise regularly and eat properly because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Uh, lazy people dread even the most basic chores. So just, uh, just making a healthy meal, you know, like, cause it's, I, I know from experience, I gained a lot of weight during COVID and I lost a lot of weight after that. I know how much more work it is to go to the grocery store, buy ingredients for a salad, cut it all up, and then put salad dressing on it to barely enjoy a meal. I know the difference between that and going to the taco truck. Can I get an amen right now? It's, it's like you can't open the refrigerator and get a hot burrito out of there. It's just too much work. It's too much work. All right. So, but we all want kind of the same things in life. Everybody. But there's a difference between that, that execution. And I know, I'm like, we're going to round this off. There are circumstances in life that make it challenging. I get all that. And I'm going to talk about that too. Wait till the end. Wait till the end. I'm going to talk about that because that's kind of where this whole message is going to kind of bring back. But um, a homemade salad is a lot more work than a taco truck for sure. Listen to the scripture, Proverbs 26, 15. <laughs> the lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. It wearies him to bring it to his mouth. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, can you picture it? He's like, got like a bowl of, he like, oh, I just can't. It's just, so, it's just so hard. I just can't do it. It was a lot of work to do that. And, and that makes me think of like, it's having good eating habits is a lot more work. It's a lot more work to meal prep. Anybody who's done this knows it's like a whole thing you have to do every week. It never ends. We all, have this, we all have similar hopes and dreams, but, but people that struggle with laziness, and we all do, it's just a matter of what degree, we all do, it, we can tend to get in the way of actually following through with those good things you want to see in your life. I hope you're starting to see it. I hope you're starting to see this. They, they want the career. They, they want the promotion, but their, uh, they re their life revolves around, uh, you know, I'm just going to take, I just need to take it easy. I just need to rest a little bit, a little bit more rest. They begin to make excuses, and I'm not talking to anybody. I feel so bad right now because I, I like to make people feel good, and I know this is like, ooh. But we, we start to make excuses. Let's just say we. We start to make excuses that get a little ridiculous. Now, we can't do that because, you know, here, let's just read it. Proverbs 26, 13. The lazy person proclaims, there's a lion on the road. Yes, I'm sure there's a, I can't go to work. There's a lie. You know, I'm, I'm late every single day because, you know, it just seems to be that's that one person, they run into the Woodbridge train every day. 
every day on Lodi Avenue. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, I would have been on our time, but like the train. Bro, the train every day? Come on, man. Like, I can see you. I see you. Yeah, I worked somewhere and it was every single day, it was the, the train. And the lazy person is like, well, you know, there's lying out there. There's lying out there. You know, gr- your grandma died three times, bro. How many grandmas you got? You can't keep, the, the excuses start to get a little bit much, okay? So, so because they've made all these excuses for themselves, verse 14, as a door swings back and forth on its hinges, so a lazy person over in his bed, the alarm goes off. But what is this talking about? Uh, a hinge is, is fixed on a doorpost. It's going nowhere in life. It's fixed. It's not moving. It's, it's there. It might, it might do this, but it's not going anywhere. Come on, we need to, we need to learn. I mean, it's kind of funny a little bit, but this, this turns the lazy person sour. The, la- the lazy person, not you, the person next to you, of course, turns them sour a little bit. Proverbs 21, watch this. The desire of the lazy man kills him. The desire of the lazy man kills him. For his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. Look, lazy people just have as, just as many hopes and dreams and desires as anybody else, but they lack the motivation to accomplish them. Let me, let me tell you something. Let me make this real for a second. Bless you. On marriage, marriage advice. Let me give some marriage advice or maybe some premarital advice. Um, I've never met anyone in the world that wants a bad marriage. Never. That probably doesn't surprise you that much that nobody ever that I've ever met that I can ever imagine is going into a marriage saying, you know, I, I just, I want a terrible marriage. Nobody, nobody. Everybody wants to have a marriage that shines, that like a light. And like in their family, they want people to see that and, and express. But here's what happens. You get into your marriage and very quickly you find out how much work it is to have a good marriage. Date nights every week. How about going like taking a day trip every couple months? How about actually processing and talking about conflict in a healthy way? Hello, I'm talking about work. Any married people in here? Come on, am I talking to a girl? I mean, are you here? That, yes, everybody wants a good marriage, but the thing is we, get, we, we run into all that hard work and say, ah, you know, well, I mean, it's a lot of work, you know, the kids, whatever. Who can find a sitter for them? It's like, we'll just, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. And we put it off and put it off. I know that's like, it's, it is, it's serious stuff because it's hard work to have a good marriage, but laziness can actually destroy your marriage and diligence can actually save it. Right. If you can discipline yourself yeah. to do the things that most of us already know we should be having date nights. Most people know that. Most people know we ought to get away from the kids at least every month or two months and have a day trip or whatever to to just solidify our marriage. And so that we're spending time together, you and me, fewer people know about that. And then every like seven months, man, let's go, let's go out of town somewhere. It's too much work though. And plus the financial problems that comes with being lazy, of course, you're not going to be able to afford, I mean, you see what I'm saying here. You find out how much work it is. Don't, don't let laziness destroy your marriage. Man, step up your game. And this time I am talking to, if I got to pin somebody down, I'm going to pin the man down. Man, guys, step it up, man. Make it happen. Nothing will bless your wife more than if you say, in a, in a loving way, all right? Honey, we're going on a date night. Like, don't be rude. Come on, guys. Track with me here. But in a loving way, to, to approach your wife and say, hey, you know what? I think it's really important. Come on, let's do this. And she might even say, you know, we don't have time, whatever. And because she's busy, she's busy too. But like, keep that coming, keep that on. It takes diligence. But if, if, we're, la- if we're lazy, it would be like, ah, I give up. Oh, it's too much work. Right. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. okay. Meddling is over. Let's continue. The lazy man lives under constant pressure. Constant pressure. Now, what's, he, what's he talking about? Let, let's read it from scripture. The lazy person lives under constant pressure. Proverbs 12, work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. First, I want to talk about how becoming a leader is something you can work towards. It's not inherent. 
It's not like some gift. You know, like there is a, a leadership gift that goes above and beyond, but anyone can function in leadership. Anyone. All you got to do is work hard. Work hard. Work hard. It, that's what the scripture says. I mean, am I making stuff up? Is, is that what it says in your Bible too? Work hard, become a leader. I'm just reading the Bible. Work hard, become a leader. Be lazy, become a slave. So being a leader is something you can work towards. Next, but lazy people rarely become the boss or they don't stay the boss for very long. Why do you suppose that is? Let me explain. Without external pressure, the lazy person is not as motivated to accomplish as someone who's working hard on their own. So without that external pressure, they don't really excel in anything. Why? Because if you're, if you're feeling lazy, if you're feeling like, I don't, well, I don't need to do it, I'm going to wait for someone to tell me, that's not the kind of person that tends to become a foreman or a boss in a job because they're not self-motivated. They're not self-motivated. Proverbs 12, um, again, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, they don't, uh, excuse me. Actually, we're going to go there. Verse 27, 12, 27, you got that one for me? Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch. Watch this. They don't even cook the game they catch because the dil- and the diligent make use of everything they find. Listen, listen, what I'm saying is the lazy person might start something, but they have a hard time finishing because they find out how much work it is. So they're not motivated to complete a task. And let's, look, look at how ridiculous Solomon is making this sound. Like a lazy person is going to go out, shoot a deer, and then be like, well, I'm just, I guess I'm not that hungry. It's just so much work. I mean, you're going to go through all that and not finish the job? But that's kind of, if we, if we notice like people at work or, or people in life, you know, you start projects. Oh, guys, come on, I'm going to get right up in your backyard now. <laughs> In your backyard, your front yard, maybe you got a little project at home, huh? You had a great idea. Let's remodel the bathroom, right? And you start tearing things out, huh? You start like, you know, start banishing things up. You start hammering some things. And then about one day through, you're like, you know, we don't need a new bathroom that bad. And then you got a tore up bathroom and your wife's like, what the heck are you thinking? What are you doing? Or like, a, you're going to, I'm going to re-landscape, you know, I'm going to, I just have a vision right here. The lazy visionary is like, just look at, oh yeah, we could do all this. You mean a couple scoops later, they're like, you know, it's good. It's good the way it is. Like this is, this is fine. And I mean, this is kids too. Like kids have to be taught. Parents, let me talk to parents for a second. Um, Parents, uh, we have to remind our kids to clean their room sometimes. It's just the way it is. It's just life. It's no problem. It's fine. You know, kids, you got to clean your room, clean your room. But if you want your kids to grow up to be leaders and bosses, we have to find ways to motivate them to be self-starters and self-finishers. All right? Because we have to remind them over and oh, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room. We're all on the same page with that, right? Everyone starts there. But how do we, how do we turn it over to, man, you, cl- you cleaned your room? How do we do that? How do we do that? Because if, if, if kids grow up taller, but they don't always grow up more mature. I'm just saying, they don't. That's our job, parents, to actually give them that, help them with that. And let me give you a pro tip. Let me give you a pastoral tip, pro tip. This works in any scenario. This works at your job. This works in the church. This works in your home. What you reward gets repeated. So for parents, for your kids, the, and you have to look, you have to look for this. Once they start doing something that you know is good for them, they, they like start to, start to move things around or they finish a job, you can kind of like gush on them a little bit. Oh man, that's awesome. Good, good for you. Awesome. Oh, you saved your money instead of spending it on another dolly. That's amazing. That's so smart, honey. You are, you reward that guess what? They're going to start associating good behaviors with good feelings. So guess what? You keep doing that. And they're in your home. They live with you for at least 18 years. You have a lot of influence. So years go by, you consistently do this. Guess what? They grow up, feel good saving money, feel good organizing their spaces, feel good making good choices because it's inherent to them because you parents have given them that. Am I helping anybody today? Is this good? Is this good advice? Because it's just scripture. Okay. It's, it's really not me. It's just, it's just scripture. Proverbs 10, 26. 
Lazy people, so speaking of kids, let's talk about employees for a second. Lazy people irritate their employers like vinegar to the teeth or smoke to the eyes because they don't do what you ask them to do. Like, hey, will you go over here and clean up this site? Yeah, sure I will. Do, 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 do. Oh, man, I'm just tired. Because we all know that one person, not you, that one who cuts corners, doesn't finish the job. You know, I used to wait tables. Uh, before I was a pastor, I waited tables. And there's always that one person that never wants to wipe down the table the right way. And they're just like, Ugh. And then you got guests sitting at like crummy, syrupy tables. I'm like, just do it right, man. Do it right. People like that don't tend to get promoted. They don't ever become the manager. They never go and own their own restaurant one day because they just, they stop at the very bottom rung. That's why the scripture says, that's why the scripture says that lazy people irritate their employers because you send them out to do something and they don't finish it. Okay, let's flip the script and get positive. All right, because I'm done. I'm done with all this. Let's talk about some good stuff for a minute. The, the opposite kind of reverse from the lazy person is the diligent. So I want to talk to you about diligence, follow through, execution, how to be a disciplined person. Because that's what we all want. But how do we do that? The diligent. Number one, the diligent person makes a habit of learning from wise people. Makes a habit of learning from wise people. Watch, this is going to tie together really close. So you're you're going to start to see how this works together. And it's all coming from the book of wisdom. Watch this, Proverbs 2, verse 20. Follow the steps of the good and stay on the path of the righteous. So step one for all of us is we need to get a coach. We need to get someone who can actually be with us in this process and help us through it. Because the the book of wisdom, arguably God himself through his word is telling us we need to follow the steps of wise people wise people or multiple coaches. Like that's what I have. I'll tell you that story in a minute, but also people who are not lazy. Proverbs eleven fourteen. 14, without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors, wisdom in having many advisors. So what we need to do really is get coaches in our lives. And I want to just normalize that. I know I talk about this quite, quite a bit because I don't think it's in our culture, something that we normally do. Um, Some people do, and we pay money for it, life coaching, right? All they do is come in and and tell you kind of what you already know and motivate you to do it. But I'm telling you, people like that are all around you. People you don't have to pay, people who love you and know you are all around you. If you would just find them and bring them into your life and and, and offer yourself to them, they will, bring you, they will bring you up to a level that you want to be in in your own life, in your own life. So I have so many pastors and coaches in my life. It's something I've always done because I have that intimate knowledge of my own, um, you know, getting saved in, you know, for recovery and addiction and kind of coming in late in life and being an adult after I got saved. I knew and I was well acquainted with my need for coaching, for pastoring. So I've always done it and I've kept it close to me because it's served me really, really well. I have people that speak into my marriage, coaches that speak into my marriage, speak into my ministry, speak into my parenting, all of it. So I would uh, uh, offer to you, get multiple coaches in your life, get multiple people. Your parents count, your pastor counts, your ministry leaders count, people at work count. Maybe it's an employer, maybe it's someone who's uh, slightly above you in in that. Um, This is all super healthy. Uh, And that's why everyone, this is just a side note, and it's obligatory for me as a pastor, but people have to understand this in the church. This is why God set up his church this way. For there to be a a pastor and a shepherd is because I'm supposed to be one for you. Even if I'm not one-on-one with you, here I am teaching you the word. And that's how God set it up. It's not for me to be the only person, but like, hey, if this is your church, like, I'm teaching you the word. So I'm one of the people that's speaking into your life and, and uh, describing these things to you so that you can continue to go out and do the same and then ultimately provide that for others. Amen. This is how it's supposed to work. It's discipleship 101. So that's what I'm asking you to do is get people that can disciple you in the key areas of life and in your home church. You know, even again, like church continues to grow. can't meet in everyone's living room anymore. 
Um, back in the day, I probably could, but not anymore. But still, here I am, and you're here on a Sunday hearing the Word of God. So I am one of those. I'm supposed to be one of those coaches. But I'm also telling you to go above and beyond that. Find a coach. They don't have to be paid. This is something that's supposed to be relational in your life. This is not in your notes, but I just wanted to add it kind of this morning, last night-ish. In Proverbs 6, it says, consider the ant, you sluggard. <laughs> I like that part too, you sluggard. It's like, geez, bro. It's like, but look at the ant. Look at the ant. Consider her ways and be wise. Like we're supposed to look at examples that, that bring us up, that lift us up, that is like, man, look at that diligence. I had one of my coaches uh, surprise me with a visit just yesterday. He's from South Carolina. He's been speaking in my life for f- several years. And he's like one of the ministry people in my life. And guess what? It was a super busy day yesterday. We had a lot going on. We got the new air conditioner put in. Come on, somebody say amen. I would have been preaching in a tank top today. Come on. Like, I don't, we're going to have church, but I cannot be hot another week. I cannot do it. It was a super busy day. The air conditioner's getting put in. I had to smog my car because I'm selling it tomorrow. And, and it's like, we had tons going on, but my, my, one of my pastors was like, I'm here in town, whatever. And I said, on everything. I made it happen because why? I value his voice in my life. And that's a, that's a mentor and a pastor and a coach to me. So that's how I live my life. And it was a beautiful time. He came over to the house. He had his son with him. And we just like spent some time. I want to tell you, you need people like that in your life. If you don't have it, you don't know what you're missing. All right. So let's just start right there. Number two, the diligent makes plans based on their life goals makes a plan based on their life goals. So I'm gonna talk to you now about budgeting, which is hard work if you're feeling, I'm tired from work, I don't wanna build a budget. It's hard. I'm talking about budgeting, I'm talking about time management, I'm talking about self-management, all based, and I'm not just, not for no reason, but based on a desired outcome for your life, which is another whole step of work that people don't ever consider or think about. What do I even want for my life? Picture how you want your life to turn out and then make the, your time budget, your money budget, your calendar budget, all work towards that goal. It is amazing how many people never do this, never do it, never consider doing it. But listen to this. L- listen, to, uh, listen to Proverbs 3. This is the proverb that probably everybody knows or maybe you've heard, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Amen. Now, let me, note, let me point something out to you. A path represents multiple steps. Amen. Ever thought of that? He's going to show you which path, which series of steps to take. He will show you the process that will guide you. Not Because some people read that and they're just like, I'm just going to close my eyes and He's going to show me every step to take. And surely he does. He, show, he, shows, he can show you every step and everything. But he's actually saying right here, he's going to show you a whole path that is going to work for your life. I hope you're seeing this. It's so, so powerful when you can get it. Proverbs 4, uh, 25, he says, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Again, multiple steps. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. So what I'm saying is, let me just say it bluntly. Every wise Christian person should have a financial plan, aka a budget. You ought to have a plan, a path, a financial path um, that is built based on values. So not just any budget, not just whatever you can grab from you. You ought to be thinking like, what do I want for my life? What do I want for my family? Do I want to travel with my family when I'm 65, 67? Okay, that's a desired end. So how do I get there? I'm just trying to help you. And it should be based on values. And Christian values, I'll just break it down as fast as I can, is giving, saving, then spending. Giving because everything we have comes from God and it is the sign that we are not dependent on our own supply. God is our supply, and that is the first sign of that. Then saving, because you're honoring yourself and your family. Uh, Some people, even worldly people, say pay yourself first. I would say honor God first, then take care of yourself with saving, and then spend money, man. And then use what you got, but plan it out, okay? Those are those values. Every wise Christian person should have a financial plan, and then every wise Christian person should have a calendar plan, 
for their life. Remember I was talking about how you treat your wife, how you treat your family, what kind of family time you're spending. Let me just tell you, if you leave it to chance, you might get it right every once in a while. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. But if you plan it out, then it's gonna happen when it needs to happen. Those family days, those date nights. I'm telling you to have a plan based on your values. I'm helping somebody right now. Because if you go home and do this, it's gonna change your life. It's gonna change your family. It's gonna change your marriage. Because you're gonna look at the values and uh, the values of time investment for a Christian person go as follows. Number one, you could probably guess it, God, then family, then work, then self-care. You need to build time around all of those things. Build time around all of those things. God, family, work, then self-care. And it's work to do this. I've, I've, I'm, I try to do it as best I can, but it is hard work, okay? That's why we offer Growth Track here is because it makes, it makes putting God first with our time a little bit easier for people to come through our growth track, to see everything that's available and to put putting God first through the local church just a little bit more easy so that you, you know kind of how to do that. That's why I'm inviting every person that hasn't done it yet, come to our growth track. Uh, join the dream team. It doesn't mean you're gonna be here every Sunday at eight in the morning. Some people got this weird idea that we're gonna like slave drive you. It's really not like that. We have a very large team for our church very large. And so it's just being part of a family, really, and then being in the lifeboat of the church. I'm inviting everybody to do that. And you're going to see in growth track, those four areas of of serving God that matter most, knowing who God is and knowing him personally, finding community, discovering purpose, and being a lifeline. Real quick, uh, I know I'm running out of time a little bit. There's this really funny story. There's a really funny story that happened to me yesterday because I have a budget. My wife and I have a budget that we try to stick to. And we're actually in the process of, uh, of you know, because we never had a car payment. It's just something we learned long ago. And, you know, we're pastors. And so we're on like kind of this, you know, a budget. Thank you. <laughs> we're on a definite budget. Um, but, you know, we're, we're fine. Everything's fine. I'm not trying to do that. But we're, we got a couple cars, almost 200,000 miles each. They, they run fine. But they're starting to break a little bit. So what we're going to do, instead of having a car payment, Tiffany's looking at me like, why are you telling everybody our business? <laughs> Sorry, honey. It's going somewhere. It's important, actually. Um, so we're going to sell both of our cars. We're going to consolidate to one really good car, and it's going to be awesome, and we're not going to have to fix it as much, and we're going to have no car payment. Bless the Lord, somebody. No car payment, man. I'm telling you what. It's a good thing if you can, if you can work it out. I understand. I'm not preaching about car payments right now. I'm just saying that, that two days ago, three days ago, I think it was Thursday, so this week, we had a budget meeting, and we decided to do all that with our cars and everything. We're like, no car payment, whatever. And I'm at the gym. It's the only place I ever get out anymore. And I meet somebody there. And I get introduced, and, and somebody's like, hey, you need to meet this guy over here. He's awesome. And, oh, he's going to bless your church. He's just being silly. He's like, oh, you're going to start giving to your church. Ha, ha, you know, you're going you're gonna to do something good for the community. Come on, get over there and help him. And so I meet the guy, shake his hand, whatever. And he's like, hey, I, I do have, like, I do sell puppies. You know, I breed puppies, and, you know, I I, I, I uh, give him my, so maybe I could, maybe we could do that. And he shows me, go ahead, let's put up that, that puppy uh, picture. He shows me on his phone. Oh my gosh. I can't even look. I can't even look at her. She's darling. I can't, I can't. It's so, and so he, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna, you know, you're a pastor, whatever. I'm gonna make you do it. So I'm thinking, you know, we're about to get this puppy. Now, so this right here, I don't know if you know what this is. This is a French bulldog, a French bully. And for those of you who don't know, um, any, any kind of French bully out there can be like five, six thousand dollars for a puppy. This color of a French bully is lavender, nothing lavender, that is gray, but that's what they call it. Lavender is a very rare color. And so that puppy right there can get up to $10,000. And so I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this puppy, I can't believe it. You know, I'm thinking, we're going to get this puppy for free. You know, I don't know. And he says, he texts me later. He says, pastor, you're a man of God. I'm going to bless you. $2,500. And I'm like, I'm going to tell you the truth. Cause this is a place of truth. I thought about it. Mind you, we're fresh out of a no car payment budget meeting. And I'm considering a $2,500 puppy. And you know what I said? I said, no, brother, I, I thank you. That's so generous. It is a, that was a generous 
offer that he made. Make no mistake about that. Very generous. I'm like, brother, I can't do that. You know what he said to me? He said, you know what? I'll take payments. <laughs> I almost got myself into a puppy payment. I just got done preaching to you about no car payments. I almost got a puppy payment. Oh my God. But here's the deal. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Without the budget meeting, it would have been a lot less clear what the right decision was. Because are you seeing this cuteness right now? Radiating. Oh my goodness. We did not get the puppy. (laughs) And we are not going to have a car payment either. Thank you so much. Okay, now I want to I want to uh, want to come through on my promise to you. I promised you I was going to round this thing off with well, what about when when things I get it. I get it. You want me to be diligent, you want me to be disciplined, whatever. You're calling me lazy all day. Got it. Well, what about when when things happen? So this is the final point. The diligent makes follow through the goal, not outcomes. Not outcomes. What do I mean by that? This is so important. When it comes to diligence, this is so important. Please listen. Because you, I just said to you, go make goals, right? I just said to you, go make a financial goal. Go make a calendar goal. Go make all this goal, that goal, that. Well, I thought you just said that. That's sort of what I said. What I meant was, and what I hoped you heard was, I want you to create a plan of steps. The outcome belongs to the Lord. Our job as human beings is follow through. Because listen, you can't determine what you weigh ultimately. You determine what you eat and when you exercise. Are you seeing this? You don't determine because things happen. You don't determine how much money you have in the bank. You determine how much you work and how much you save. Are you seeing it? Certainly those things are related, but anybody who's lived one day in the real world knows that financial tragedy can strike and health issues you didn't ask for can arise. And that's hard. You know, when you, when you work out and you eat, but you're struck with like an illness, you would be tempted to look at me and say, now what pastor? I thought you said, if I did this, I'd get that. What I want to give you is Make follow through the goal. That's what you're responsible for. We can't control everything. Life happens, there's challenges. The lazy would use that as as an excuse to give up. I'm telling you church, don't give up on your goals, your plans and your follow through and trust God with the outcome. Trust God with the outcome, even if it's not ideal, especially when it's not ideal. Getting what you hoped for doesn't really take a lot of faith. But getting something you didn't ask for, are you seeing what I'm saying now? When life happens? You know, like when when Jesus raised Lazarus, but not his cousin? That happens to us all the time. Happens to people all the time. Happens to people I know and love, and it hurts Listen to this. I hope this encourages you. Proverbs 16, three, commit to the Lord, whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Some people read that and think, well, if I commit to God, he'll give me what I want. Right? Sweet. Let me read it again with emphasis. You, you commit to the Lord, your actions. You commit to the Lord and he will establish Create, solidify those paths, those plans, the outcomes are the Lord's. You commit to him, he will show you, which he, he will establish your plans. Not fulfill whatever dream you have necessarily, but he'll, he'll, he'll establish your plans and he'll take you on the path that is his will. Personal story. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a grown son. He's he's twenty something. He, he's twenty. And uh, you know, when he and, and I, I grew up, like I said, in the addiction scene and whatever. He was born before I got saved, and so he's over in that town, and I'm over here. And when he was a teenager, you know, I, I had plans for him. 
he was going to come over here and he was going to live with me because, you know, I'm the man of God. So he ought to just do whatever I just, you know, God, why don't you go ahead and make that happen? And I made a, I made a play. I went for it. But it didn't work out that way. Let me tell you, some of you have been through that exact same scenario where you went for the thing that you believe was God's will, you hoped for it, you believed for it, and it just didn't happen. Let me tell you, God will unfold that story. All I know is I was supposed to try. He's got a great mom, a loving family on that side. He's good. My job is to trust God with the outcome. Because even parents, especially parents, you got wayward kids or your kids are over here or your family members are going through it, whatever. You don't own their outcome. God does. Your job is to pray. Your job is to go for it, guys. Don't be, don't be lazy in those things. Don't be lazy in trying. Make follow through the goal, not the outcome. So now's the time to commit because there's another scripture. I, don't, I just thought of it this morning, but there's a scripture in Proverbs 6 again, talking to the lazy person. How long will you sleep? When will you wake from your slumber? When will you, like, when, when are you going to choose, is what Solomon is saying to his sons and to us. How long is it going to take for you to just, just do the next right thing in your life? And that's, that's my invitation to everybody today. It's just to make, I'm going to follow Jesus. That's all I can control I'm going to be diligent in that. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to believe he's got his best in store for me, and I'm going to follow him. I'm going to make that invitation for, for all of us here today. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray right now that anybody who's on the verge of making that commitment, and even some of us that need to remake that commitment, that we would just do the next right thing, which is following you. And if that's you today, I'm speaking to everybody here. If that's you today and you want to take that next step and you want to recommit yourself to just following him, heads down, eyes closed. I want to know who I'm praying for. That's about it. Just, just lift your hand up. Let me know that's you. I want to read. Amen. I see you. Amen. I see you. Amen. I see you. Is there anyone else in here? Come on. It's all right. Now's your moment. Now's your chance. Now's your time. All right. Let's pray together as a church. Everybody, come on. Let's pray together as a family today. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I'm choosing to follow your son, Jesus, today. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.